In November of 1797, two poets and a young lady went for a walk, discussing the idea for a new poem. One of the poets mentioned that his neighbor had just told him of a peculiar dream he'd had of a skeleton ship with figures on it. From these humble beginnings, ultimately, would come one of the most significant poems ever published in the English language, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Now, my name's Dan. You're watching Bookworm History. Welcome back. As promised today, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, published first in 1798. Now, Coleridge himself was born in 1772. By 1797, as a young man of 25, he was happily married to a young woman named Sarah, and had just moved to a house in Somerset, staying with friends, and just down the road from an old acquaintance of his, one of England's most celebrated poets, William Wordsworth, which quite frankly I've always thought was just a fantastic name for a poet. Wordsworth lived with his sister, a young lady by the name of Dorothy, who kept house for him. Now, Coleridge made the acquaintance of Dorothy during this period, 1797, and together the three of them, Coleridge, Wordsworth, and Dorothy, would become incredibly close friends. As Coleridge himself would later describe it, three people, but only one soul. It was also during this period that Coleridge himself would attain his greatest success as a poet, composing the three poems that he's perhaps most known for, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, of course, uh, Kublai Khan, as well as Christabel. Uh, now, Kublai Khan has an interesting story in and of itself, but we'll leave that for uh, perhaps a, a later date. But if you're interested, uh, uh, Google it or look it up. It's fascinating. Now, the ancient mariner itself came from rather humble origins. During this period, when Coleridge was living in Somerset, he was discussing with a neighbor of his, a man named John Cruikshank, a dream that Cruikshank had just had, of a skeleton ship with figures on it. Now, Coleridge didn't really think much of it at the time, although later, when Coleridge, Wordsworth, and Dorothy went out for a walk in Quantock Hills, they started discussing ideas for a poem to finance a trip that they were eventually planning to take, and Coleridge brought up the idea of Cruikshank's dream. And it was during this walk that ultimately the idea, uh, the, the whole plot for the Ancient Mariner was uh, essentially uh, hashed out, yeah. as Wordsworth himself would later write. Much the greatest part of the story was Mr. Coleridge's invention, but certain parts I suggested. For example, some crime was to be committed which should bring upon the old navigator, as Coleridge afterward delighted to call him, the special persecution as a consequence of that crime and his own wanderings. I had been reading in Shedlock's voyages a day or two before that while doubling Cape Horn, they frequently saw albatrosses in that latitude, the largest sort of sea fowl, some extending their wings twelve or thirteen feet. Suppose, said I, you represent him as having killed one of these birds on entering the South Sea, and that the tutelary spirits of these regions take upon them to avenge the crime. The incident was thought fit for the purpose, and adopted accordingly. I also suggested the navigation of the ship by the dead men, but did not, but did not recollect that I had anything more to do with the scheme of Poe. This famous walk occurred on November 23, 1797, and after working on the poem for around four months, Coleridge would make his first recitation to Dorothy and Wordsworth in March of 1798. The Ancient Mariner would first see the light of publication in a book called Lyrical Ballads, published later that year in 1798, to which uh, Coleridge uh, supplied four poems, Wordsworth wrote the rest. Now, the book itself uh, did not sell very well initially. Uh, as the publisher of the book later told Coleridge, most of the sales uh, had gone to sailors who thought that it was a uh, nautical songbook. Not really surprising given the title, Lyrical Ballads, and the fact that the poem uh, that started the book was called The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Now, there was no mention in the original Lyrical Ballads of 1798 who actually wrote The Ancient Mariner. The book itself was published under Wordsworth's name, uh, but there was no indication that Coleridge had actually written the poem or that anyone other than Wordsworth had. It wasn't until 1800, in the second edition of Lyrical Ballads, that Wordsworth first mentioned that the Ancient Mariner had been published by a friend. Uh, whether or not this was to give credit where credit was due, or whether because the Ancient Mariner was not very well received by critics, uh, and Wordsworth was trying to distance himself from it, is hard to say. Originally, when it came out, some of the uh, more colorful uh, critical reactions uh, labeled it as the extravagance of a mad German poet, and another labeled it as the strangest story of a cock and a bull that we ever saw on paper, a rhapsody of unintelligible wildness and incoherence. So it's entirely possible that Wordsworth was simply seeking to distance himself from the poem. He actually at one point considered leaving it entirely out of the second edition of Lyrical Ballads, but ultimately decided to include it. Now Coleridge himself in the second edition of Lyrical Ballads tried to make the poem at least a little bit more accessible, uh, removing some of the archaic language and removing uh, 46 lines altogether uh, while adding seven. 
While it was certainly no secret at the time that Coleridge had written the poem and not Wordsworth, it wasn't actually publicly identified as belonging to Coleridge until the publication in 1817 of a book of Coleridge's poems called Sibylline Leaves. It was here that Coleridge attempted to make the poem even more accessible by adding a marginal gloss, uh, notes on the side of the poem explaining some of the action that went along or uh, behind the scenes um, uh, doings uh, concerning the plot. Uh, he also added uh, 18 lines and uh, removed nine others. Now, the 1817 publication was the last significant revision that Coleridge would make. Uh, it was published again with slight changes in 1834 in the second edition of Sibylline Leaves, but ultimately uh, the changes themselves were, were only trivial. The, the last significant change was the addition of the gloss in 1817. Now, Coleridge himself, uh, following the uh, initial publication of The Ancient Mariner, uh, began to slip downhill. Uh, by 1800, uh, tensions in his relationship with Wordsworth had ultimately caused the two to part ways. Uh, Coleridge was becoming uh, an opium addict, uh, and uh, debts were starting to pile up. Coleridge would pass away on July 25th, 1834. Now, being the poet that he was, Coleridge had actually, several years earlier, composed his own epitaph. Stop, Christian, passerby. Stop, child of God, and read with gentle breast. Beneath this sod a poet lies, or that which once seemed he. O oh, lift one thought in prayer for STC, that he who many a year with toil of breath found death in life may here find life in death. Mercy for praise, to be forgiven for fame, he asked and hoped through Christ, do thou the same. Now, as regards some of the language and some of the differences in various editions of uh, The Ancient Mariner, uh, one of my favorite differences, and, and uh, my, my personal favorite as far as editions of the poems, is the one that came out in 1834. And odds are, if you go and, and pick up a copy of the poem, that's probably the one that you're going to find, uh, unless you find a volume that has all of them uh, labeled as such. Most notably, the 1834 edition with the gloss and, and with the, the uh, subsequent changes that Coleridge had made to it, uh, it's probably what you're going to come across. And it's very good, it's fantastic, and it reads very well, and it's just it's a wonderful, supernatural, uh, fantastic voyage. Uh, however, there are certain things about the original 1798 edition that I also like. Uh, most notably, my, my, my favorite uh, portion of that particular poem is uh, the, the scene where the ghost ship is, is coming, across, uh, coming upon the mariner's ship, uh, and uh, death and life and death are uh, playing dice for uh, the souls of the, the ship's crew. Um, initially, in the 1798 version, Coleridge had actually put in a description of death, not just life and death, which uh, the, the famous uh, uh, harlot uh, of the uh, subsequent versions, uh, who was also included. Uh, and after the fact, Coleridge pulled out the description of death because, uh, you know, perhaps it was thought too scary for the time. Uh, but it's it's one of my favorite uh, favorite portions, and the fact that the whole thing just got ripped out of it in subsequent editions gives me no end of amusement. Uh, so you really kind of have to to dig a little bit for it to to come across the 1798 version. Uh, but I'll uh, I'll uh, elaborate here. Um, His bones were black with many a crack, all black and bare, I ween, jet black and bare, save where with rust of moldy damps and charnel crust they're patched with purple and green. Her lips are red, her looks are free, her locks are yellow as gold, her skin is as white as leprosy, and she is far liker death than he. His, her flesh makes the still air cold. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were playing dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistled thrice. A gust of wind start up behind, and whistled through his bones, through the holes of his eyes and the hole of his mouth, half whistles and half groans. Now, aside from the, uh, the stanza describing the dice game itself, all of that was, uh, was ultimately removed from the uh, 1834 version. However, uh, Coleridge does uh, add in the description of, uh, of the harlot uh, that her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold, her skin as white as leprosy, the nightmare life in death was she who thicks man's blood with cold. That's from the uh, uh, 1834 version. Uh, Coleridge, and just uh, to make a, an interesting side note, when he uh, labels her as a nightmare, uh, hyphenates the word, going back to what was originally the definition of, of nightmare. Uh, to quote from the Oxford English Dictionary, a female spirit or monster supposed to beset people and animals by night, settling upon them when they are asleep and producing a feeling of suffocation by its weight. Uh, 
So the, the typical version, of the, the typical definition that we think of these days uh, for a nightmare as being a bad dream, Coleridge goes with the uh, original version of, uh, of sort of an email, uh, an evil female spirit. Now, if you should happen to pick up a copy of the poem, fantastic, it's a, it's a wonderful poem, it's a quick read, it's, it's just, it's, it's great, it's wonderful, it sparks the imagination, there's, there's just so much fantastic imagery about it. Uh, if you decide to dig into it a little further, I would highly recommend, highly recommend, that you find a copy of Gustave Doré's uh, engravings that went along with the poem. Now, uh, Doré was famous uh, for doing engravings uh, for things like the Divine Comedy, for the Bible, for Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven. Now, it was truly a, a labor of love for Doré to do these engravings, uh, as evidenced, if nothing else, by the fact that he had actually completed them, which was no small task, uh, completed them before even having arrangements worked out for their publication. Um, now, in, in terms of illustration, uh, it's, it's a little bit more difficult for, uh, for an illustrator to come across uh, defined images for a poem like this. Now, the poem itself is very anachronistic, and the only real clue that Coleridge gives as to time period in the poem itself is uh, in the second part of the poem, when he says, the fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Now he's talking about the Pacific Ocean, uh, which was only seen by European explorers in 1520 by Magellan. Uh, so the poem uh, essentially takes place at some point before 1520. Uh, so Coleridge, or, uh, so Dore had a little bit of an idea of, of what to work with, uh, but ultimately looking at his engravings, uh, they're, they're, they are very anachronistic. Uh, they're, uh, he went for more of a medieval setting for the wedding at the beginning. Uh, he went for more of an uh, age of exploration setting for the ship itself and the crew. Uh, but to look at them uh, carefully, uh, clothing doesn't quite seem to match. Um, certain instruments don't really seem to match. The settings don't, don't really seem to match. Uh, so Doré essentially created this whole world, uh, using picking and choosing uh, things that he felt uh, fit for the, the uh, time and place of the poem. Uh, and just combined them all into this this fantastic uh, other world uh, that he places the poem as taking place within. Uh, they're, they're wonderful engravings. They match the spirit of the poem, in my opinion, just spot on. Um, and I think they're really some of Dore's best work. As a, as a huge fan of his other works, too, I think that The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner is really uh, uh, just some of his best. All right, so that's what we've got for you today. Uh, if you like the video, please do like it, subscribe to the channel. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter, at Bookworm History, for uh, some interesting uh, literary historical uh, tidbits and updates on when new episodes come out. Uh, next time, in honor of Halloween, we're going to be discussing the behind-the-scenes of Bram Stoker's Dracula. Fantastic story. It should be a lot of fun. I uh, hope you'll join us then. Uh, stay tuned, and thanks for watching.